Welcome to Slash Forward. We all know that it can be hard to find meaning and satisfaction in the daily rut of corporate life. Everyone involved in that endeavor is tasked with the personal requirement of finding the thing that motivates them so they can carve out a little place within the broader organizational structure to feel fulfilled and worthwhile. But what if despite all of that, you come to find out one day that your job is actually just a front? The things you produce are actually inconsequential because the company you work for isn't doing anything more than collecting a group of test subjects to experiment on how normal people react to being put into situations of extreme duress. These are the questions we will have to contend with as we recap the 2016 movie The Belko Experiment. As these various characters work their way through this catastrophe, be sure to take note of whether there's any way to ensure individual or group success. Would you be able to take the necessary actions to at least have a chance of survival? And is wanton destruction the only way out of this? Or could you come out on top with a relatively clean conscience and a reasonably low body count? Leave a comment to share your ideas. And while you have a few free moments, be sure to check out some of my other videos. Let's get to it. We open in Bogota, Colombia, in a bustling market full of shopkeeps and buskers. Here we find Mike stalled in traffic on his way to the old 9 to 5, a stark, desolate office building with an unexpected uptick in security that seems to be affording some employees a free day of PTO. Once inside, the normal preparations ensue as some employees prepare their minds for the day ahead, and the true titans of industry commence with absolutely crushing it. Elsewhere, in an undisclosed location, we see that their every action is being monitored. After settling in, we meet Vince, who is onboarding a new hire named Danny. He goes over her entire orientation package, which included the installation of an official company tracking tag in her head to protect their precious commodities from kidnapping. On the floor, we hear an employee explain that Belco is a nonprofit whose purpose is to facilitate the hiring of U.S. workers in South America. We then meet Wendell, engaged in the business of creeping out the ladies, but at least he's trying to be cute about it. His advances are unwelcome, however, because Leandra already has a semi-casual relationship with the somewhat less unnerving Mike. Out in the bullpen, Danny meets her new compatriots, Leota and Roberto, and even receives her first seduction on the job. What a welcoming and comfortable work environment. Then, after noting the apparent skeleton crew that day, it's remarked that most of the local employees were being turned away at the gate. Mike then returns to his unsecured workstation and resolves to ask someone about the uncomfortable abundance of gun-wielding guards today. Unfortunately, information is very limited. The conversation is then interrupted by an inter-office announcement. In eight hours, most of you will be dead. Well, that's a welcome shakeup to the work week. They're all tasked with killing any two of their co-workers to avoid repercussions. Since this drill was not announced to leadership, Mike takes it seriously and recommends his crew evacuate immediately. Employees in various other parts of the building respond in different ways, and those who happen to be in the front lobby bear witness to the beginning of a complete lockdown, including shutting off of any outside communications. As they all begin to group up, maintenance opts to see if they can blowtorch through the metal facade, while another group heads up to the roof. As they all get busy, Barry takes control as a top capitalist in the room and tries to calm everyone by offering up some possible explanations of what's going on, each of which he delicately withdrew directly from his ass. But Mike is not quick to be put at ease. Up top, the roofers discover that things are looking fairly isolated, while elsewhere, the metal is discovered to be some sort of special alloy that seems impervious to torching. Mike tries to be helpful by noting the mounting evidence that this ain't no prank, and also shares how he saw a guard go into the nearby hangar this morning. However, when you're in charge, it's your duty to both calm your wards and also to disregard their input so as to maintain organizational control. Meanwhile, the roof crew tries to flag down a guard, but his T must have fogged up his tactical goggles or something. Marty begins to suggest that all of this is part of some grand psychological test being undertaken, but the test quickly turns physical. They flip their shit while most of the others sweat it out in the lobby, right up until Johnson develops a terminal headache. This prompts them to duck for cover, assuming a shooter in the ceiling. But Mr. Norris is a brave boy, and he notes that the wound appears to be the result of an internal combustion rather than a bullet. Fiddling around a little with his scalp flap confirms it for him. Mike immediately thinks back to his company-issued head implant, which the local workers did not get. Aha, so that's why they were sent home. 
Bud sees the writing on the wall and arms Lonnie so they can forge off on their own and form an alliance. Mike then begins frantically searching for something sharp, which he cleans with a mild detergent so he may give himself an extreme haircut. But the voice comes back on and insists that he stop. Unless, that is, he prefers his face falling out of the back of his neck. You couldn't have chimed in before he hacked up his shit? With that option ruled out, they begin to suture up Mike's open wound. Since he's preoccupied, and it's almost certain they're all going to die, Wendell takes a minute to once again shoot his shot with Leandra, and he seems to be compelled by her disgust. In a conference room somewhere, Terry and Vince are able to confirm the presence of hidden cameras. While back in the lobby, Barry breaks protocol by requesting Evan provide him the keys to the company armory, which Evan declines. With things getting tense and toasty upstairs, the maintenance boys head down to the furnace room to see if they can get her kicking again but the voice interrupts them to announce that the game they're playing is a fairly open sandbox. Currently, the only rules are to not disable cameras or remove transplants. They're then given two hours for 30 of them to become dead. If they fail, 60 of them will get exploded. Lonnie immediately begins to break down, while Wendell goes feral and starts to rush to find whatever weapons he can. This causes the strong to follow his lead, and the meek to scurry off and find hiding places. The atmosphere further deteriorates when Marty tries to big brain the situation by setting off the fire alarm to alert the authorities. But as confirmed by Evan, it's a self-contained system, so he goes to shut it down. Before he can, Lonnie reaches his breaking point, lashing out and inadvertently putting a dent in Bud's dome, totally ruining his hairline. The startling nature of this turn flushes out Danny, and in the ensuing guilt struggle, she jams Lonnie's head onto some excess rebar that never got cut back. Upstairs, Barry tries to slyly broach the topic of figuring out how they're going to deal with this mass murder situation, but his stark utilitarianism doesn't get him very far. Mike insists on trying non-lethal alternatives first, since it's likely that the powers that be aren't going to let them go nowhere, no how. A group of them breaks off to start working on a banner they can hang from the roof, while everyone uses their free time to consider other options. But no sooner do the normies leave than the remaining blood faction begins forming their devilish alliance, resolving to embrace their boldness. Meanwhile, Marty has a working theory that they're being pushed into taking extreme action by psychotropic narcotics laced into the water supply. And then, as the roof group finishes their party banners, it's noticed that the blowtorch has gone missing. They discover it's being used on the weapons locker, so they can stash them away for safekeeping. Because what could be less safe than an iron cage? Evan has a chance to diminish their power, but pacifist Mike feels compelled to intervene. However, that doesn't mean he abides by their actions, and in one fell swoop, lines begin to be drawn. Upstairs, Mike tries to warn the others about Barry, Terry, and Wendell, but Leandra is a realist who doesn't put too much trust in human nature, so she warns him not to trust or help anyone if it can be avoided. Even these turds over here. Yeah, obviously, we, we all just heard your whole conversation. Back on the roof now, the gang tries to hang their flag, but now that the game is on, the guards are eager to stretch their trigger fingers. Mike insists on persisting, despite the brutal murder of Keith's girlfriend and the voice warning them against hanging banners. Ultimately, Vince has to pull him back to keep him alive, and they all sulk back inside, completely deflated by their failure. With time for personal reflection, Mike begins to wonder what his job even was, suggesting the government has only employed them here, so whatever this is could happen. Hey, it sounds like you have a purpose, my friend, but this revelation is quickly forgotten when the weapon aficionados ambush them to acquire the locker keys. Evan's response prompts Wendell to get his stabbing legs under him. Then they just walk downstairs to retrieve the keys. No staffing required, it seems. The end result of this? A happy day in Guntown. Then Barry takes on the true role of COO, having everyone gathered into the lobby so he can decide who lives and who dies. As this takes place, we see the guy who is crushing on Danny has aligned himself with the winners, but also allows her to keep her hiding spot. And Mike regains consciousness just in time to be rounded up. In the lobby, Leandra becomes despondent in the face of all this reality being presented before her. Then Barry starts separating folks by family size and age so he can get a better visual of what they're working with. He tries to help the medicine go down by explaining how necessary this is and that their sacrifice will be appreciated by the survivors for sure. But with a dearth of elderly lambs, he's forced to start picking at will and right in their faces. With resistance to the process, strongly discouraged. Once the final selections have been made, they hit the tunage, you know, to get
get in the mood for slaughter, and it works by God, but Terry seems to be losing his will to win. So Mike tries to convince him to let him borrow his gun, just for a minute, so he can see something. In response, Terry tattles on him, like a little bitch. Since Barry's hands are full, he is given the order to do his buddy. But at that precise moment, Danny had decided to try to slow things down by cutting the power. This creates a panic, requiring the weaponeers to begin shooting blindly into the void. As they all run amok, Danny slips in with Roberto and the two pals take refuge above the elevator, while elsewhere some of the other victims decide to fight back in brutal fashion. This whittles things down to just Terry, Wendell, and Barry, who have now converted to open hunting season. As the announcer informs them that they're one body shy of their goal, Terry is closing in on Leandra, who has disconnected the paper cutter and set a trap. Once ensnared, she teaches Terry about consequences, but only to a point. As a result of this, Barry is faced with the brutal reality reality of missing a quota, something that really aggravates his inner drive to succeed. They all brace themselves in preparation, as multitudes of their rank have their skulls blossomed in a symphony of blood and viscera. In the aftermath, the survivors count their blessings, until learning that the final game is that the killer with the highest body count gets to live. With Barry and Wendell in a comfortable lead over the others, the scramble to ferret out survivors and notch their belts begins. The men become brutal savages as the motivation for self-preservation takes over. Back in the lobby, Leandra walks in on Marty and Kubiak collecting unspent explosives from various craniums to see if they can blow the front door open. In a final gambit, Leandra gets on the intercom to plead with Mike to come join her in the lobby. She then wanders into the cafeteria where she runs across Wendell. She manages to shoot him once, but then he takes out the others as they attempt to finish the job. Ultimately, Leandra is able to hatchet his head all to hell. She then reunites with Mike as Vincent is busy making cocktails, and Danny is working to escape the elevator shaft. They become privy to the bomb sitch, but then get pinched up by Vince and Barry. When all is said and done, Barry manages to take down Vince, and the only other survivor when Danny tries to exit into the lobby. Elsewhere, Mike learns that Leandra took a hit, so as Barry stalks the halls, they find a nice, quiet place to die. Now at the end of his rope, Mike confronts Barry over the matter of the murder of his casual girlfriend. Barry was in special forces, but Mike was a huge fan of ECW back in the 90s, and he leverages this knowledge to come out on top, going absolutely apeshit on Barry's face. The lights then come up and Mike is announced to be the last remaining employee. He is then escorted out of the building. They drag him to the hangar where it's revealed that they were all part of a large behavioral experiment. But the details are irrelevant at this point, so Mike notifies them that he planted the collected explosives on all of them, and leaps to the control panel to flip as many switches as possible. To finish taking out the trash, he puts into practice what he learned at the office that day. When the job is done, he leaves the hangar, but not the attention of the true overseers, who commence stage two of the experiment all over the place. The Belco experiment is another example of a strong but simple concept executed well. There was enough relational exposition to get us invested in the characters, but not too much to drag down the story or slow the action. They did a really good job of bringing it all together and escalating the tension at a steady clip. With that said, there were a few things that I thought would be important to note regarding strategies for success. In the event you ever find yourself in this type of situation, fortunately the risk of that may be significantly reduced due to the recent increase in remote work. But if you are still an office goer, I would encourage you to spend a portion of each day walking the halls to take a little mental break, get your steps in for the day, and size up your co-workers. Note the likelihood of being able to beat them in a physical fight, as well as any potential weaknesses they may exhibit. It's never too early to prepare. With that information in hand, you only have to employ one simple strategy. Pay close attention to the rules as they unfold and be decisive in how you'd like to proceed. If you're going to be aggressive, do well in your aggression. If you'd rather wait it out to see what happens, hide well and don't come out. Realistically, for most of the rounds of this game, life and death were basically a coin flip, so your actual attitude and ability would really play a factor in whether you had a higher chance of survival by trying to win versus just rolling the dice. Ultimately, they wanted to whittle it down to a single winner and funnel everyone into a situation where they would have to choose to kill in order to survive. You don't know this up front, but if you played the odds and found enough luck to be one of the final group, your next move is a simple math problem. They were going to kill everyone who wasn't already dead, other than the person with the most kills. Luckily, the people with the most kills are automatically the individuals who you should feel the least guilty about killing. 
How you go about it really depends on your confidence level. If you want to minimize your own responsibility, you may only have to kill a couple of people, those who have the highest body counts. It's just a matter of timing and deciding whether or at what point you want to interrupt any infighting to make your move. Being careful to weigh the risk of death by coworker against that of running afoul of the ever-present timer. Before we go, I'd like to give a huge thanks to my donors, memorialized in the Hall of Headshots. I have a website set up where you can support the channel through donations or merch. Any donation unlocks a growing collection of uncensored movie recaps. And if you enjoyed the video, I would love for you to become part of the channel by subscribing. Thanks for watching.